morning. Thanks for being with us today. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Central Church, and we're glad to have you. Uh, if this is your first time visiting with us, we love to, to know that. Um, and you can let us know that by mentioning something in the comments like, hey, I'm new, or uh, hey, nice to see y'all, or something like that, so we can uh, connect with you. Uh, you can also email us at uh, our information page, which is on our website as well. Um, uh, typically, we do a, you know, stand up, high five, and a meet and greet, but uh, since we're doing this virtually, we ask that you would uh, greet one another by uh, texting somebody that you hadn't spoke to in a while within the church. Now, I must admit, um, I was on vacation when we first did this, uh, and when it happened, I was like, why are these random people texting me? But it was really encouraging uh, to receive texts and even continue those conversations. So we'll give you some time to do that now, and then we'll come in and do a little bit of announcements. Amen. So uh, we have a couple announcements for you today. Our first announcement is about some of our uh, COVID outreach that we are doing here in the city, uh, and so we, are been, we have been preparing meals for uh, DPS schools, and so Christ Central is partnering with uh, our two educational outreach partners, C.C. Spalding and Glenn Elementary, uh, and so we are, what we are doing is we're providing food and uh, delivering those uh, items to families uh, in the highest level of need during this time. So I want to just say thank you, first of all, to our 10 volunteers who, who came and helped uh, we had people who shopped, we had people who stored food, we had people who delivered food uh, on this past Monday. I want to say thank you to Amy as well. Uh, Amy is a Christ Central member and a social worker at Glenn, uh, and she's leading this initiative. And so uh, you can join us this upcoming week and fill in the gap that's left by uh, Durham Public Schools. And we just want to uh, use this as an opportunity to love on our city, uh, to be in Durham for Durham. And so if you want, uh, more information on that, you can email Amy. Uh, her email will be in the comments, and you can connect with her. Uh, but we are so grateful that we have a church that's loving on our city in this way. So thank you for all who's uh, been involved and those who haven't. Uh, we'd love for you to join in and get in on this work that God is doing through our church to serve our city. Uh, next is uh, we want to like kind of plug people in a little bit more. Uh, so we ask that you can uh, sign up for our segmented list. So what that means is that uh, if you want to receive updates and news uh, that's relevant to you and your interests, you can select what you like. And so that goes from uh, 20s and 30s ministry, our Christ Central kids, our Central students, uh, our college, our 50 plus uh, group, our missions, our men, our outreach, our educational partnership, our other outreach with housing and habitat. Uh, and also our women's ministry, and if I missed any, we'd have a list for that one as well. And so the, there, there will be a link in the descriptions that you can go to to join so that we can kind of help tailor those news updates so that you might be able to stay informed. All right, let's go into a time of worship. Uh, Psalms 100 reads as follows. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. 
We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. This call is a call that we uh, come to weekly. But God calls us all the time to worship his name. So let me pray as we go into a time of singing and worship. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that we are able to gather. Uh, even if it's virtually, we're thankful for the technology to be able to do so. God, we ask that you would grant us this time that we might be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would begin to uh, cultivate within our hearts praise and worship of your name. Lord, even in the midst of these times and the sufferings that some of us are experiencing, we ask that you would give us praise on our tongues and words from our mouth to give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
moved into the time of our service where we dismiss our children, uh, but we want to pray for our children instead of dismissing them. So, uh, Christ Central, I ask you this question, uh, what is our prayer for our children at Christ Central Church? And we'll say all together, may the word of the Lord grow in their hearts. We move to a time of corporate confession of sin in our uh, service. Uh, and some of you might ask why, and I think Scripture uh, teaches us uh, in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 9, that uh, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, and that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so we corporately do this every Sunday. And so I ask that you'd read along with me, uh, and knowing that in this confession, it's not one that is empty, but Scripture teaches us that God is faithful and he's just to forgive us and cleanse us. So join me in reading our confession. Jesus, a king rules. It's what a king does. He sets the standard by which all his subjects must adjust. I confess that I do not always look to you as having the authority of king. Sometimes I take your word and see it more as a suggestion than as a command. Forgive me for desiring your intervention in my life as king, but still refusing to follow you as lead in my life. I seek to obey you more. Give me a heart to do that. Let's take some time to privately confess to ourselves and to the Lord. Our assurance of pardon, we know that in Scripture that God has made us, uh, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, into a new creation. And old things have passed away, and what is being birthed in us is by the power of his spirit, his word, and his love. And so I ask that you would stand with this reverence and with this boldness, knowing that that God is faithful, uh, but also that God is holy as we do our assurance of pardon. Psalms 103, verses 8 through 13. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Let us keep this same reverence as we sing together in worship.
hear my mocking cries call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is fair Move my mountain, he can move my mountain, he can move my mountain, he can move my mountain. 
be seated. If you were standing and worshiping with us, uh, we've moved uh, into a time of offering. Uh, and, and during this time, I'd uh, like to point out the fact that um, the reality of offering is not any different than worshiping. It, in fact, it's just a continuation uh, of worshiping God. Instead, we're worshiping him with our, our finances and our tokens uh, and our material things. Uh, God is faithful, and he, he does well, and he gives us uh, what we need and then some. Uh, during this uh, season, we are not able to, uh, like, pass around the basket for giving, but there are multiple ways in which you can give. You can give through our app. Uh, you can also give uh, through uh, our online, through, through the website. Uh, and if you want to mail in your giving, you can do that, too. You can see our address uh, for that. I'd like to say uh, that your uh, contributions uh, and your giving and your worshiping God in this season is helping many. As I announced earlier, we uh, as a church have been uh, working to serve alongside those uh, who need uh, food in our Durham public school system. And, and we are doing that. We are committed to helping and serving in that way. And so everything that you give um, is contributing to those uh, those efforts of us being able to give um, and uh, contribute to our community. So let me pray uh, for our time, um, and then we'll have a time of giving. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for your grace uh, and your provision in our lives. God, thank you that we can be a church that uh, continues to be on mission. And I'm grateful for the generous hearts. Uh, we are grateful for the generous hearts in our church that uh, continue to give and contribute uh, in ways that allows us to be on the ground and serving in the city and also helping with those uh, who have need within the church. God, I pray that in this season that you'd bless us, not just in a financial or material way, that you'd continue to give us uh, every spiritual gift as Scripture teaches. Uh, now bless those who are generous, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We moved into a time of congregational prayer, and we do this weekly as a church. And, and although it looks different, I still would uh, challenge you and invite you to share your prayer requests with us via email or in the comments or in our, our, our virtual tear-off tabs. Uh, so today, uh, tip, what we do typically is a, a church of the week, and we do a prayer focus, uh, ministry focus of the week. Uh, so today, our church of the week will be St. Philip's Episcopal Church with Reverend uh, Jonah Kendall, uh, and then our prayer focus, our ministry focus will be college students uh, whose semesters have been disrupted because of uh, COVID-19. So I ask that you would join me uh, in a time of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you again. Uh, we are grateful that we are able to gather. Lord, I want to lift up uh, our Church of the Week, St. Philip's Episcopal Church with Reverend Jonah Kendall. God, I pray that in these times that uh, you would be uh, the, the, the God of provision for them. God, I pray that uh, you would give them wisdom in how they uh, love and serve uh, their church body and their community. 
God, I thank you for them. I thank you for uh, the grace that you've given them to do ministry in the city. God, I pray that uh, during these uh, times that have uh, somewhat uh, kept us away from being uh, mobilized in churches in general, Lord, I pray that we, uh, that this church, that uh, the pastors and the staff would find unique ways uh, to be creative and serve in the community. Be with them, Lord, as they uh, desire and still press on to do ministry. Be with their hearts as they find ways to uh, be, be, uh, be more committed to the folks within their church. Uh, be with their minds, God, as they personally deal with uh, the, the impacts that COVID-19 is bringing upon us uh, individually. Uh, undergird them with strength and power and authority uh, and help them to do your work well. Lord, we want to lift up uh, for our prayer focus all of our college students who have been impacted in their semesters uh, just... Um, fragmented, Lord, in different places. I pray uh, in the midst of what could be a confusing, anxious, depressing time, God, that your grace and your power and your authority and your wisdom and your comfort would just be with them. Uh, they wouldn't worry necessarily about tomorrow or the future, which is hard to do, uh, but God, that they would be comforting and knowing that you uh, can do all things. And not only that, but Lord, you are working through every intricate detail because you're sovereign and we know that. And so God, I pray that we uh, would be able to uh, support them from a distance, to love them, to say uh, encouraging words that they, that they might find some joy, some encouragement in this season. Pray for those God in our uh, church who are maybe even on their way uh, thinking about colleges and how this might impact them. Lord, we know that you are sovereign over all. You are not surprised, nor are you asleep. And so, God, I pray that uh, as Timothy comes up to bring us the word, God, that you would be with him as you've been with him during this week and his preparation. God, I pray that you would be with his heart as he preaches and that he will proclaim a word from God uh, through the scriptures that will impact us in a way, Lord, that we might love you more, that we might press closer to you, that we might not fear, but trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Aaron, and good morning, Christ Central Church. I hope you all had a happy Easter. Uh, no doubt I wish, as I'm sure you do as well, that we could have enjoyed it together in person face to face, but I am hopeful that the good news of the resurrection gave life to your weary souls nonetheless. This morning we are starting a new sermon series in the book of Psalms entitled, Hear Our Cry. And I realize that many of you probably haven't spent much time in the Psalms, and so I want to begin by giving you a little introduction to the book. And the book of Psalms is a a unique book in the Bible in that it is a book of music. Contrary to most of the Old Testament, the chapters of this book are not stories to be told, but rather songs to be sung. And I need to point out here that these are not your ordinary feel-good songs, but rather they are prayers put to music. They are intimate accounts of God's people crying out to Him from the depths of their innermost being. Now the Psalms are, knowing now, excuse me, what the Psalms are, the question then arises, why are these most intimate prayers included in our Bible? And the answer is, as I hope you will soon discover for yourself, is that these songs, these prayers, are tools for us on the journey of life almost like a, a walking stick on a, on a long hike. They exist to empower us to take another step, to journey on. They're travel songs, and by God's grace, they make the journey of life a little bit more manageable. But why now? Why should we as a church pull out this dusty old hymnal in this moment, in this season? I think there are two reasons why. The first is because we just finished a study in the book of Ecclesiastes, a book whose resounding message was all is vanity. 
And therefore, church, we are in great danger of wallowing in misery, of stopping singing altogether. And so we need the Psalms right now to compel us to sing again. Having now seen that this life, uh, for what it really is, we need the Psalms to teach us how to sing in the midst of such great vanity. And the second reason why we need to study the Psalms right now is because COVID-19 is making it really hard for all of us to sing. It's as if this virus has has placed noise-canceling headphones on all of us, and and so we can't hear the tune anymore, and, and most of us aren't yet brave enough to sing a cappella. My hope is that over the next few weeks that all of us would learn some new travel songs, songs for us to sing as we march along, songs that bring healing to the sick, hope to the hopeless, faith to the faithless, and joy to the joyless. I invite you now, wherever you're at, to stand for the reading of God's Word. This morning we are looking at Psalm 3. This is God's Word, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be on your people. The prophet Isaiah says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but God's word endures forever. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word, the words of life. We believe that your word is true and that through your word we encounter you, the living God. And so this morning we ask that you would speak to us, that you would allow me, your unworthy servant, to get out of your way so that we might encounter you, the living God. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The more that I study the life of Jesus, the more that I realize that this man was far from ordinary. One of the most glaring examples of this fact is the story of Jesus asleep in a boat in the middle of a storm. Are you familiar with this story? Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and somewhat abruptly he decides that it's time for them to cross over this body of water to the other side. And the text doesn't allude to this, but I think we have to imagine that the skies were a little ominous when Jesus made this request. And I'm quite sure that the disciples, many of whom were fishermen by trade and were well versed on rough waters, were not really excited about this plan. But they obeyed nonetheless, and sure enough, as soon as they got out into the middle of this body of water, the storm that was once far off, all of a sudden was right on top of them. Years ago, I had the unfortunate experience of coming very close to being caught in a boat in a storm. My family was taking what was supposed to be a sunset cruise aboard the Stars and Stripes, a retired America's Cup sailboat. And the trip began beautifully, wonderful voyage, but about halfway through, I noticed that the expressions on the faces of the crew began to shift. Long before I noticed the storm, the crew began scurrying around the ship as if they were back in the America's Cup again. And it was the look in their eyes that revealed everything. These expert sailors were scared to death. You see, they were scared because they knew that there was nothing they could do if we were still on the water when the storm hit. At that point, we'd be completely at the mercy of the sea. 
And I think it's this experience that causes me to so marvel at, at Jesus' maritime adventure. How could Jesus sleep at such a time as this? How was Jesus able to rest in the middle of a storm? Our text this morning is a song about a man who is experiencing quite possibly the greatest storm of his life. And yet in the midst of this storm, verse 5, it says that he was able to lay down and sleep. I wonder how many of you are right now in the greatest storm of your life. And if not the greatest of your life, no doubt this pandemic has created a sizable storm for all of us. Yet the promise of Psalm 3 to us is that we can find rest in the storm. That there is, in fact, an antidote for your anxious fears. And what we see in Psalm 3 is that there are three steps that we must take to achieve that peace that we long for in the face of the storm. Not so much a formula, but rather a posture towards life and towards God that offers us the peace that we so desire. And those three steps that we will be unpacking together this morning are, first, we must name our fears. Secondly, we must turn our gaze. And lastly, we must change our tune. The first step towards rest in the storm is that we have to name our fears. Psalm 3 was written by King David. And one of the hidden gems of this psalm is that we are given the circumstances around its composition. The subscript tells us that this psalm was written while David was fleeing from his son Absalom. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the life of David, this is referring to really the low point of David's life, the time when his son Absalom betrayed him, started a rebellion, and it became clear that Absalom was willing to do whatever it took to seize his father's throne, even if it meant killing his own dad. And so King David is forced to flee from his palace, from his home, and go into hiding. Can you imagine what this was like for David? Can you imagine the hurt, the shame, the the regrets that he was probably feeling? It would have been one thing if some foreign ruler came in to take over, but to be ousted by your own flesh and blood. This storm would have been overwhelming for any of us. But what does David do with all the fears and anxiety that he is feeling? What the text reveals is that the first thing he does is he names them. He lays his fears, each by name, in front of God. Verse 1 says, O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. There are really two main fears that David voices here. First, he states that his enemy is too many, and he fears that they will defeat him. This is that on top of the surface fear, the fear of failure, of defeat, of death. But look again at verse 2, and you'll see that the second fear that he names is a little more under the surface and a good bit more weighty. He says... Many are saying of my soul there is no salvation for him in God. You see, David's clearly having a hard time putting this fear to words, and so somewhat sheepishly he places this fear in the mouth of his opponents. He's saying, God, you know my enemies are saying that you aren't going to save me from this storm. And you know, God, I'm I'm not saying I believe them, but it's really hard not to in this moment church is not is that not the far greater fear not that our enemies will overwhelm us not that we will be defeated but that our God is in fact unable to rescue us as Charles Spurgeon once said it is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to the fear that there is no help for us in God Church, what are the fears that you are facing right now? What are the things that you need to acknowledge, that you need to name to God? What are the things that deep down you worry God won't be able to rescue you from? 
No doubt this is a scary time for all of us. And that the, the choice yet that we have to make is either to name these fears or to deny them and pretend like they don't exist. And I have to confess that I have felt a strong urge these past few weeks to, to numb out to deny my fears, to throw myself into Netflix or or mindless games or alcohol or work, to grab hold of something to take my mind off all the scary things that flood my mind if I sit still long enough to let them, to grab hold of something that will give me some semblance of peace and enable me to cope at least for a moment. But the truth is, and we all know this to be true, that the only way to find a true and lasting peace, the peace that enabled Jesus to to snore in the storm is to openly acknowledge, to name the fear and anxiety that we're all experiencing. Church, who else knows what is keeping you awake at night these days? And even more important than that, have you brought your anxious fears before your Heavenly Father? Because this is the first step in your journey towards peace in the storm. This brings us now to the second step in fighting our anxious fears. We must turn our gaze. What's interesting is that in in verse 3, after David has openly and honestly acknowledged his fears to God, he then abruptly turns his gaze away from his problems and towards something else. And here's where we see this delicate balance between openly acknowledging our fears and dwelling too much on our fears. Because the truth is, if if we look too long at our enemies, our enemies seem to grow in size right before our eyes. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say over the past few weeks that they have started limiting the amount of time they spend watching the news. And the reason why is exactly what we are talking about. Because if you watch the news long enough, the coronavirus will become too big for you. It will begin to overwhelm you. And so we we have to avert our eyes. There's this beautiful picture of this idea in Numbers chapter 13. You see, God had promised his people that he was going to give them a new land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And when they finally arrive at the land... They send 12 spies to go and check it out. And 10 of those spies come back and they say, no way, man. The enemy is too big. They're like giants and we're like grasshoppers. They will squish us like little bugs. But two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they bring back a very different report. In fact, they say the exact opposite. Verse 30 They say, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well and able to overcome it. So how do we explain the two different reports? And the answer is that I think the ten spent too much time looking at their enemy. They dwelled too much on the object of their fear. And yet Joshua and Caleb, they took another approach. Now don't miss this, church. It's not that Joshua and Caleb refused to look at the enemy altogether. No, they went and spied with the other ten, and they saw the very same thing that the ten saw. And yet, after they saw the enemy, they turned their gaze towards something else. I want you to listen to the words of Joshua from chapter 14 and see if you can't pick up on what they turned their eyes to. He says, The land which we pass through to spy it out, is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Did you catch it? The pathway to peace And the storm is through turning our eyes away from our enemy and toward the face of God. As a parent of four children, I'm often invited to events where my children are to perform in some way. Whether it be a sporting event or a school play or a dance recital. And in my house, there's often a lot of nerves heading into these performances. 
But something that I've, I've found rather humbling as a parent is that in all of these performances, as soon as my child comes on stage, they inevitably, immediately begin looking for mine and Stacy's face. And up until they find our faces, they, they, they are full of anxiety and fear. But as soon as they find us, as soon as their eyes meet our faces, peace settles over them like a warm blanket in a cold winter night. If you've been joining us for midday prayer these past few weeks, you're aware that the prayer guide that we've been using is called Seeking God's Face. The title comes from another psalm by David, Psalm 27, where God literally commands David to seek his face. And the reason why God makes this command is because God knows that in the midst of the storm, that which most deserves our attention is not the storm, but rather his face. Look again at our text at how David seeks the face of God in the midst of this storm. Verse 4, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. You see, David is declaring here that in spite of the fact that when I look at my enemies, they seem too great for me, and yet I know that you, my Lord, are greater than my enemies. And then he begins to recount the character of God, the character that he has learned over the years through seeking God's face. He says, you are my shield, meaning God is his protector. He says, you are my glory, meaning God is his king. He says, you are the lifter of my head, meaning God is the antidote for his despondency, the only true source of hope in this life. He says, you are the one who answered me from your holy hill, meaning that God is not some far-off, uninterested being, but rather he is one who is near, who listens, who answers our cries. Church, when we, when we see the face of God, when we know and believe in the character of our God, although we might be in the middle of a storm, we know we are not at the mercy of the sea. But rather, as I mentioned a few weeks back, we remain confident that we are in fact in the palm of his hand. No doubt the application is clear. In order for you to find peace in the midst of the storm, in the midst of coronavirus or whatever you are facing, You must look to the face of God. You must look to and trust in the character of God as he has revealed himself to us in his word. Now more than ever, we must turn off the news and we must pick up this book and be reminded of who God is. And when we do that, James Boyce rightly declares, we will see God's true great stature and our enemies will will not grow but will shrink to manageable proportions. No doubt the coronavirus is something that we are right to be afraid of. But let us not lose sight of the fact that this virus pales in comparison to the might and the power of our great God. Which brings us to our third and final step that we must take in our pursuit of peace in the midst of the storm. And that is we must change our tune. What do I mean? You see, when we're willing to openly and honestly acknowledge our fears to God, and when we see God's face and we're reminded of His character, what inevitably happens is that we begin to sing a whole new genre of music. No longer do we sing the blues, but now we begin to sing something that sounds much more like the old African spirituals. Because, you know, the difference between the blues and the African spiritual is that although both are written from the heart of the storm, the blues music knows not how to anchor itself in the salvation that is to come. But at the heart of every African spiritual is that although sorrow may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. There's a trust that no matter what the circumstances might be, we have a shelter in the storm. Look again with me at our text. Verse 4 says that David cried aloud to the Lord, And that he knew the Lord answered his cry, and then he laid down and went to sleep. Don't miss this, church. David went to sleep long before God delivered him from his troubles. 
when David is writing this, he's still on the run. His son Absalom has yet to be defeated. In fact, in writing this psalm, David has no tangible evidence that he is ever going to get out of this storm. Nothing at all is pointing to his deliverance. And yet somehow, verse 3, he stops singing the blues and instead sings this African spiritual and then he lays down and he goes to sleep. All the while, the storm is raging all around him. How can this be? Verse 8 is the answer. See, David knows deep down, deep in the innermost part of himself, that he is safe because his salvation belongs to the Lord. Church, do you believe that even in the midst of this storm, whatever storm you are facing, that your salvation belongs to God? I have a vivid memory of a time in my childhood when I found rest in the midst of a storm, peace in the face of great anxiety. I was in high school and I was given the opportunity to go out to California and to climb what the mountain climbing world calls a 14er. A 14er, quite simply, is a mountain with a summit greater than 14,000 feet above sea level. And in order to climb this mountain, we were required to split up into teams of four, three rookies and one guide. And I was scared enough as it is, but my fears were greatly magnified when we did our fall training. We had to practice how to handle the situation if and when someone on our team fell. You see, because there was a certain point on this climb where we were going to have to traverse an ice-covered face. And apparently it was highly likely that one of us would fall on, the, on this portion of the climb. And the fall procedure including, included, at this time, the four of us connecting ourselves to one another by a single rope. And each of us was giving, given an ice axe to carry. And what we were taught to do, what we practiced doing, was when someone fell, the other three people were to immediately lay down on the side of the mountain and dig their ice axe into the mountain as hard as they could. And what we were told would happen is that because we were connected by this rope, that the one who fell would be caught by this rope that was anchored to the three other climbers who were anchored to the mountain. And I have to be honest with you, all the fall training did for me was make me more afraid. And the crazy thing is, it actually wasn't until we got to this part of the climb that my fears subsided. And believe it or not, the fear went away through me falling. Through me actually losing my footing and having my team hold me up. Through the experience of the rope actually catching me, just as our guide said it would. Church, in the midst of all that's going on right now, I have to ask you, who is on your line? No doubt the storm is raging all around us. Who is with you in this storm? Who is watching over you? Not to keep you from falling, but to hit the deck when you fall and to hold you until you're able to get back up. Church, now more than ever, we need to be connected to one another so that we can weather this storm. At the same time, I hope you know that having some good people on your line isn't enough. No doubt my teammates on that climb provided great confidence for me along the way, but the reality is, apart from the guide, apart from the expert who led the way, I would have never truly felt safe. You see, because I knew that my guide was one who had already made it to the summit and who had came back down to help ensure that I would in turn make it to the top. And ultimately, way more than my teammates, I put my trust in her. Church, Hebrews 12 serves as a powerful reminder that our guide, Jesus Christ, made it to the summit. That he, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And through his resurrection, as we talked about last week, he has proven that salvation belongs to him. And therefore, because of the resurrection, we can trust Jesus when he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You see, but the hard part about all of this is that just like 
my mountain guide in our fall training couldn't prove to me that I would be safe if I fell. I can't prove to you that if you put your trust in God that he will in fact deliver you from the storms of life. And yet I take comfort in the fact that that's not what the Psalms are all about. Eugene Peterson gives some really helpful insight here. He says, the Psalms exist not to argue God's help, nor do they exist to explain God's help, but rather they are a testimony of God's help in the form of a song. As Peterson points out, as pastors, we're often asked to explain God to his disappointed clients. We are thrust into the role of a clerk in the complaints department of humanity, asked to trace down bad service, listen sympathetically to aggrieved patrons, try to put to right any mistakes I can, and apologize for the rudeness of the management. And yet the truth is, it's, it's actually not my job to defend God, nor does he need me to defend him. But rather, the proper work of the Christian is, quote, witness, not apology. Which is exactly what David is doing here in Psalm 3. He isn't trying to prove God's character through a well-laid-out defense, but rather he is bearing witness to the goodness of God that he has experienced in his life through a song. And may I be so bold as to do the same this morning, minus the singing part. I can't prove to you that God's salvation is sure. But I can testify to the fact that my God has been a shield for me. That he has been the lifter of my head. That he has heard my cries and answered them over and over and over again. And because of that, I am confident that my salvation belongs to him. And I truly believe that he will rescue me in the end. And it's in light of that that I charge you, church, like David, to acknowledge your fears to God to turn your face away from the storm and turn your face toward His. And the result will be that you, like me, will find yourself singing a new song, a song that is not about the thrill that is gone, but rather about that sweet chariot that is coming for to carry us home. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank You that You are present in the storm, that the storms of life are not evidence that you are distant, that you are away, but that we can trust that in the darkest hours you are most near. And Father, I ask that you would meet us in that place, that you would teach us to turn our gaze away from the storm and to your face. And that we would have great confidence and hope in you in the midst of life's storms. God, teach us how to find peace in the storm and that peace in you. In Jesus' name.
judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. And I
secure from all along. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting. Oh. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thanks so much for joining us. I do hope you will take advantage of some of our virtual offerings this week and that you will tune in again next week with us. Here now as God speaks over us his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs> Yeah,